I'm Neha Parashar working in a healthcare company and based in Germany. In this new video series that is Dare to Lead, we have our guest today. He is an associate vice president in R&D division and a global portfolio lead at Biocon Biologics. He is a very inspiring leader. He handles a team of around 100 scientists. He is a member of the R&D senior leadership team and you can see a huge passion for science in his eyes to bring affordable medicines to patients. If I start counting his achievements, then the time will not be enough. He is also a reviewer for Journal of Pharmaceutical Sciences USA. He has been a member of USP Insulin Expert Panel from 2015 to 2020. He has received several awards for his excellent leadership journey and he received his PhD in Pharmaceutical Sciences from University of Buffalo, USA. Despite having all the wonderful achievements, he is one of the most humble and approachable leaders whom I know. Let's give a warm welcome to Mr. Karthik Ramani. Thank you Karthik for joining the call. I really appreciate that you could find the time for this interview. Thank you Neha. It's a pleasure to be here. So, Karthik, I would just like to uh, first start with your journey. Like, um, Tell us something about how was your childhood, where did you born and where did you do your initial schoolings? So, I was born in Chennai and uh, my entire schooling was in Chennai uh, until I finished my 12th grade. So I studied in a single school. I didn't change any school. And uh, yeah, it was a, a, a middle class family. Um, happy go lucky. Um, had a pretty enjoyable childhood. Had a lot of good memories. And uh, I didn't travel much actually uh, to a large extent. Uh, I think my, if I'm right, my first travel itself was actually to uh, to go to Pilani to do my actually undergraduate and graduation studies. Um, so yeah, uh, but of course, I think when I grew up, uh, I think I had a uh, a great passion for music. So uh, I was trained. I started my uh, percussion training uh, essentially in Mazangam uh, when I was the age of four. So and I used to give a lot of concerts. And Chennai being the hub of classical music activity, I got a lot of opportunities to perform in various music halls in Chennai. And uh, I used to uh, appear in, in uh, Doordarshan uh, uh, and actually uh, I was one of the child artists where I could, uh, they used to call me to perform for uh, several uh, performances. So that is how I think my entire childhood was. And uh, of course, um, very playful. And uh, actually, I don't think I was ever focused much on studies to a large extent. Um, and I think probably the only time I studied was when I was in 10th and 12th. Otherwise, uh, I think I was just happy with. Uh, uh, I would say I was never I was never on the top of the class. So I was always somewhere in the let's say an average student to a large extent. Uh, until I graduated and I think that journey continued in my college um, I don't think I I really changed even after entering the college so that is how my childhood was okay so then you ended up doing B Pharma and then uh, masters from Bits Plani you could really yeah. move into the uh, very reputed college and then you uh, moved to US so can you just give, give us some brief about your this journey? How do you ended up doing the pharma field? What motivated you basically to move to pharma field? Well, I wanted to be, well, as uh, at that time, I think you either have to be a doctor. Or so I was definitely, I definitely knew that I did not want to be an engineer. But so I definitely had a lot of passion for biology and chemistry, the life sciences. And I... Uh, I definitely wanted uh, to get into a good uh, uh, reputed medical college and uh, I think at that time uh, it was kind of uh, I couldn't I didn't actually pass any of the entrance exams uh, uh, none of the exams clicked and at that time I think we also had this Mandal Commission uh, that was uh, that became very active in 1992-1993 so I think all the state governments uh, of India, they introduced the various reservation policies. And that subsequent, uh, subsequently uh, essentially resulted in uh, uh, 
uh, what do you call uh, uh, a lack of admission and even in, in my home state of Tamil Nadu. And then bits happened, and I wanted to continue to uh, be associated with an allied healthcare team. And that is how I think biological sciences and pharmacy kind of opened up those opportunities. And uh, of course, even after I, uh, I think graduated, I was probably the only person in my group or in my college batch where I didn't uh, appear for a single, uh, I would say, campus interview. So I, I knew I didn't want to work. Uh, but I really did not know what I should actually be doing. But so I applied for uh, uh, rather, I would say I did my, I think one of the turning points I should say was when I uh, actually did my internship in Spick Science Foundation channel. It was actually in a plant molecular biology laboratory. And uh, I think that is where I think my first mentor, Dr. Narayanan, uh, under whom I started doing certain research work. And probably that was my first inflection point, uh, I would say. It was the first trigger that uh, kind of research really excited me. And certainly, I think he played a very important role in uh, shaping up my thought process then. And uh, that is when I decided to uh, give my uh, total GRE. And then subsequently, uh, I applied to uh, both life sciences school as well as uh, pharmacy schools. And, uh, and then university at Buffalo happened. I actually first joined the medicinal chemistry program uh, and the medicinal chemistry program then eventually moved out of the school of pharmacy and uh, they merged with the school of chemistry and natural sciences. And then subsequently, I moved, uh, reapplied to the pharmaceutical sciences program, which was associated with the school of pharmacy and then started my PhD around 2000, 2001. And then spent about five years there and uh, and then I just uh, decided to come back uh, after I finished my PhD. I didn't stay back there. Uh, I didn't. Uh, I did apply for certain interviews. I got a couple of uh, offers, uh, but somehow at that time my heart was not staying back in the US, and I wanted to come back. And uh, that's how I joined Biocon way back in 2005. Okay. So basically, we all need right mentors at right time and you really found Mr. Narayana at right, right moment in your life. So he, he really Absolutely, you absolutely. Too. Yeah, okay. Fine. Absolutely. I think that was my first, uh, I would say, entry into research and how a, a career in research could uh, look like. And and definitely, I think, of course, my, my, uh, uh, my time in graduate school really shaped up quite a lot of things, my thought process. And I had a great advisor uh, who, who was very gracious. I was his first PhD student. And uh, it, was a, it was a tremendous year. Uh, very adventurous at the same time, very fulfilling year. Okay. So your heart was always in India and you came, instead of working there in US, you came back to India. Uh, yeah. And you started your career with Biocon in research. Um, but why only research? What drove you at that time to only go into research and not any other departments? Uh, well, I didn't know anything else. Let me put it that way. <laughs> when I joined the industry, I had no idea. I was a novice and uh, and I'd, uh, I'd worked in, and I think when you work in pharmaceutical sciences, you realize that it is a very applied, it is a very applied area. Uh, it is not uh, basic research, but it is applied research. So definitely, I think uh, coming back uh, to R&D uh, involve, uh, involving in applied research was something that fascinated me. So I think uh, joining R&D became a logical extension of my journey in pharmaceutical sciences. I think joining R&D became a, it was kind of a logical extension for me uh, after finishing my PhD in pharmaceutical sciences. And um, and I think pharmaceutical sciences, I think it allowed me to do a lot of applied research. So it was not on basic sciences, but it was very applied in nature. So, and I felt that joining an R&D division of a biopharmaceutical company will be the most logical thing to do. Of course, uh, I think at the time I joined, uh, I didn't have, uh, I would say, uh, I didn't have any clue on what kind of work it will actually be. Uh, I didn't know whether it was going to be an extremely laboratory-oriented role or is it going to be beyond uh, 
beyond the working in a lab which i think is what has turned out to be uh, over the years but yeah when i joined in uh, uh, i think i kept a very open mind uh, in terms of what that opportunities could offer okay fine so um, coming back to your journey then so you joined biocon you joined as an associate scientific uh, manager at biocon right in your initial position yeah, yeah okay yes. and then today you have to, uh, you are heading a department uh, a big team of around 100 scientists you are associate vice president so how did you reach so fast in your ladder in your career ladder what really uh, helped you there and how was your journey if you can give some insights on that yeah so i actually started uh, when i joined biocon uh, i think uh, biocon was just getting into the biologic space i think we had just launched insulin in around uh, 2004 december um in india for the first time i think until then it was uh i think only uh, novo and vidi who were whose presence were felt in india as far as uh human in human insulin products were concerned and i think biocon really changed the game in 2004 when they came in and i joined about a year later uh, almost a year later so i think the when i uh, before i came to biocon i think uh, i had interviewed with uh, the then president of r&d and a senior colleague of mine and uh, uh, i think they said that they would like to uh, they're building up a team for biologics uh, they need to develop a lot of uh, skills and capabilities uh, to be in the space and uh, so they are looking for someone uh, who can contribute to this journey uh, build teams and they said why don't you come and help us set up uh, a product development laboratory uh, and since my focus area was on formulations uh, at least i was interested in formulation and product development i said why not i'll just come and i would like to be part of the part of the team so when uh, i was the first member of the of the formulation team uh, so and they said uh, we need to Uh, we are going to be handling. We are going to be expanding our portfolio of products, and we need a uh, lot of people to work on various uh, programs. And I think it was also fortunate that around the same time, I think quite a lot of people came back to India uh, and joined Biocom. So we had a lot of people who had either finished their PhD, went on to do postdoctoral training in uh, in reputed uh, institutions, and they all wanted to come back. So quite a few of us actually joined around that. Uh, around the 2002 to 2005 uh, time frame and that is how i think various uh, divisions within r&d focusing on biologics product development uh, actually started growing so we had people coming and joining the cell culture team uh, we had people coming and joining downstream purification then of course the formulation team that i was trying to set up and then we assembled uh, a really amazing set of people i should say over the years uh so definitely it was a steady but a very organic growth of people as well as portfolio of products that we worked in and uh, i think uh, one of the key thing uh, i would say was i think at the time that i i joined uh, we had a bunch of passionate people who wanted to do something um uh, and uh, so we were just figuring our way out it was a very entrepreneurial journey for all of us very adventurous trying to do something for the first time in india uh and and of course i think uh, what helped the most was the uh, i would say the commitment of the management then uh, led by kiran uh to actually invest a lot in biologics and wanting to actually uh, make a big name in the biologics space and most importantly i think uh, uh kiran's passion to ensure that you can actually make such complicated drugs in india and in a very affordable manner and at an extremely large scale i think these were the kind of themes around which all our early years of discussion uh, used to be and it continues to be there till today uh, i think uh, that is what uh, i think to a large extent galvanizes uh, people uh, because uh, uh, certainly the introduction of insulin human insulin injections in india in 2004 was a really game changer it just brought down the the pricing to a significant extent uh and the affordability quotient just exploded 
uh and i think doing that in india really brought in a lot of focus from across the globe that hey look i think we are uh, we can do really something special and i think that continues even today in various avatars uh, of course we have evolved with time uh, but definitely i think that uh, that basic passion that uh, we should make things affordable to people and they must be able to have uh, life saving drugs at their disposal at any given time uh i think that i think continues to be the common theme even today yeah, so kiran manjumdar sho who doesn't know her she has really done such such a fantastic such unbelievable work uh, impact to bring affordable medicines and you have been one of the backbone i would say to make her dream successful uh, working on insulins or Uh, just being the first company who was working who brought the trust to the mabin market in the developed market like us europe and all so you have really been a support system uh, of supporting backbone uh, in her success and to everyone in india who dream to be a scientist like you um maybe coming back to your leadership style so i see you personally as an expert leader but maybe you can share uh, what kind of leadership style do you prefer what do you like basically so can you give us some insights on your leadership style kartik uh see i i don't think i follow any uh, single type of leadership style uh, see i think uh, over i think i've changed over the years especially uh, i think when you start uh, i think yeah you do have a certain technical and domain knowledge uh and uh, you bring in certain uh, depth of of uh, knowledge and experience but you lo- you you will realize for anybody who has entered the pharmaceutical industry you just realize that you have so many brilliant people around you uh and they all come with different kind of domain expertise uh so the important thing is that uh, uh you accept the fact that you don't know many things and once you realize that uh you don't know many things it becomes easy that you become grounded and uh, it helps you to learn things so i would say over the years uh, i think from just being a technical leader i think i've learned to uh, work with uh, uh, lead small teams then mid sized teams and big teams and then work with people across the organization in different divisions in different departments who may or may not be directly connected uh, to your core work and uh, essentially uh, you have to develop that uh, network and ability to communicate uh, across the organization to achieve what you want uh, at the end of the day you realize that you cannot do it i think that's a given uh, you just cannot do it you need an army of people to help you in this journey and uh, and you can you should uh, accept the fact that you need help and it is okay to say no that i don't know this particular area of work or i don't have expertise in this and you reach out and uh, i think that is where i think uh, situational awareness is very important uh, i think you need to be aware of things uh, meaning when i say aware you should aware you should be aware of what you know you should be aware of what you don't know uh, you must not hesitate to reach out for help where it is required and yeah and in the process uh, continue to be curious inquisitive uh be open to learning uh and you have to unlearn things quickly and uh, i would say relearn uh a lot of things and it's a it's a it's, a, it's an extremely uh, it's a it's a highly regulated industry uh so definitely i think and you're dealing with human life so definitely i think uh uh, uh the respect to human life and patients uh, is absolutely going to be the driver or the core for your existence and uh, i think uh, that is what i think i would say uh, has changed over the years for me. Uh, just from being a domain expert or a technical knowledge expert uh, i think understanding the the drivers in this industry who are the stakeholders who are the players in this industry because at the end of the day you have to work with the the various policies uh, that the government comes and so a lot of things influences the industry uh, not only in india but anywhere you take and uh, uh, you'll have to appreciate you have to integrate all of that 
it's an amal- amalgamation of all of these things coming together uh, which you i think when you start your journey from a graduate school you just don't know the complexity is involved and i think once uh, you get in into the you get into the ecosystem you realize how complex and humbling things can be for you yeah and i really liked what you said that uh, it's okay to say that you don't know it's okay to reach out to people that you don't have answers to everything please help me out um but it's not always easy also it needs some kind of courage everyone can't do it so uh, karthik did you learn this over the time or you were already born with this what do you think leadership is kind of something which people are born with or they can learn it over the time uh, can you give some advice on this okay. so let me answer your first question uh, did you how did you get the courage to say no i think uh, one of the important things uh, that i learned from the graduate school training that i had is that you cannot be right always uh, and uh, there will be a lot of things that you don't know and i think our dep- I, i think that graduate school training as part of my phd journey was certainly something that i uh, i i would say uh, i took a lot out of the journey uh, and i think the courage to say that okay i think uh, i don't think i know this particular subject and uh, i must uh, defer to somebody who's probably a, an expert in this area and i think uh, our whether it was my advisor whether it was the uh the department faculty uh, uh i think they always encourage to speak our mind out and uh, they always encourage us to kind of be bold and be courageous to accept some things um uh during our department seminars or even our classroom discussions and i think probably i kind of literally uh i would say follow that i follow that to the t even today uh meaning it's okay to say i don't know and i think when you say that uh, i think automatically you will realize that people will come and help uh and people will be willing to kind of come and teach you and share their experiences um uh, now to your second question is leadership inborn or your thought in my view i think it is uh, it is something that uh you constantly change over a period of time i don't think you you have any inborn leadership i don't believe in that i think circumstances and uh, opportunities kind of shape up the person you are um and uh, uh and i think uh i would say uh, as i said i have learned many things over the years and i've tried to be as adaptable as possible to the evolving uh, situation and circumstances around So in my view I think uh, definitely leadership can be taught you you actually see see uh, as human beings you will have to keep observing others uh, you just cannot be working in in silos so you will automatically be looking at people your colleagues uh, your juniors uh, uh, your seniors uh, and uh, you will uh, without even realizing I think you will start imbibing many things Uh, it's a kind of a osmosis that constantly keeps happening just like how people might learn from me i think subconsciously or consciously you start learning you constantly learn from people and you take many things small small things which you may or you may not realize uh, in the moment that you're working in uh, but i think when you if you take a step back introspect and reflect uh, you will say hey yeah yes i think what this person did he or she did was actually fantastic and what and how how they handled a particular situation is something that uh, i think uh, i should keep in mind uh, in case i come across or i'm experiencing a similar situation so yeah uh, so i think in my view uh, it's a constant journey and you will continue to learn from people around uh, in various ways uh, there is nothing like you will be in one but of course there are certain things there are certain inherent characteristics uh, that you are born with i think some people are extrovert uh, some people are introvert uh, so i don't think i'm an extrovert i'm definitely an introvert uh but yes i uh some people are quite bold and very and measured um whereas some people are quite bold and they speak their mind out so i think i belong to the latter category to speak my mind out a lot uh it kind of helps me to challenge the status quo uh, challenge things around me and at the end of the day the challenge is not to make people feel bad but it is to get the best out of the situation what should be the right thing that we should do when you are in a given situation uh so yeah uh, i think uh, these are things that uh, i think you will keep calibrating yourself 
uh, as you go along yeah okay yeah so that's uh, an important message i would say to all the audience who is watching us now uh, that of course uh, what karthik said of course you are born uh, with certain characteristic but you do not have control on it but there are lots of characteristic which you have control and on and you can actually build you can actually grow and work on those characteristic and grow as a leader so someone is not born with a leadership it's something which it's a constant journey which we evolve to in our life so Absolutely. i second that thought uh, karthik thank you for your insights uh, we'll come back to your research interest and um, i know how much passionate you are for research and we all know that by now uh, so but research is all about failure and then experiment how do you not lose your patience when the things are not going the way you thought it should go um, the lack of patience is something which the young generation is really dealing with uh, i mean lots of people they approach me and ask me how to in, in, increase our patience level so that's something everyone is dealing with nowadays uh, what message would you like to give on this aspect to the young generation especially um see i think uh, once again i think uh, patience is something that uh, you learn with time i don't think uh, you are you are born uh, born to be patient uh, human beings are restless uh, evolutionarily and that is how we make progress uh but yeah i think once again the the, the graduate school journey uh the educational background the the journey that you put yourself through as part of your phd training does teach you a lot of patience uh like i was the first student of my of my advisor and uh, uh literally we had to build the lab from scratch there was no body of data to build in so we had to start somewhere um and we had to write uh, so he was busy writing his grants i used to help him uh in sections of writing those grants then we had to write uh, scientific publications in order to uh, demonstrate that you are doing cutting edge research as well as uh, uh, create that network that you have entered this particular field of work and yeah it was not easy uh, certainly there were a lot of rejects that we had in writing the scientific publications in fact i remember that uh, i probably wrote probably about 15 or 20 drafts of my first research paper and it got rejected everywhere um, so it was quite disheartening it was not like i was not disheartened and uh, but it also teaches you uh, a lot of things in the sense uh, when you look at kind of uh, objectively look at some of the feedback that we received during the course of that time uh, it made a lot of sense uh maybe in that moment i think we were very frustrated but uh to take a step back once again and reflect uh and i think all of these inputs that came uh, as part of these reviews really added a lot of value to the work that we made in terms of how do we crystallize our thoughts uh, how do we structure the the question that we wanted to answer and uh, and definitely i think uh, uh my advisor played a lot of uh, he played a very key role in trying to keep me calm and grounded even as we were getting rejects uh so and i think that uh, i think probably once we broke that uh, what you call that barrier uh, i think you realize that hey this is what it is uh, you kind of it's, it uh, it hits you that you just cannot be you cannot do things in a hurry and you're going to have uh, you need to you're going to you're being watched by the scientific community uh, scientific community community around you and they're going to be uh, your uh, judges Uh, whether you like it or not and uh, so once that kind of uh, once you accept it uh, i think you realize uh, you just go through the you go through that process and uh, and i think you you kind of uh, temper your expectations uh, you you do know that when you're going to say write a publication you are going to get a lot of feedback some journals might accept it some journals will not accept it and uh, and there's nothing uh, uh there's nothing to feel bad about it is what it is uh and everybody is doing their work uh, to make things better uh so i think that kind of that journey really kind of helped me to uh, i i would say uh uh temper my expectations and uh, just go through the process and probably once again uh i didn't realize that uh, some of these things will teach me to be uh patient about a few things and uh, accept certain things and work towards 
bringing in more objectivity in my work mm-hmm. okay so there is no there is no shortcut here uh, i think uh, uh, you are going to have a lot of hurdles and you will have to overcome them uh, it's not a free uh, it, uh, nothing is nothing is free <laughs> you have to earn your way through uh, and i think once you accept that journey mentally uh, i think it becomes easy yeah so i can i could ex- uh, extract some um, good messages from what you said uh, this the acceptance is the key you ha- have to accept how it is what it is and then move on and also the self reflection is something which you focused on so that's also one of the key to uh, keep your patience and not losing it uh, over the time so Absolutely. thank you yeah thank you kartik for this message and um, now let me ask you uh, kartik is inspiration for many people who is inspiration for kartik i just don't have one person i have many okay um so i i have too many people to uh, to look up to uh, uh i look up to my mom uh, for her enormous amount of patience and composure that's that she exhibits in extremely difficult uh, situations i've all uh, i've admired my late father uh, for his loyalty and focus uh, uh i love mandalan srinivas uh well he's also he's late mandalan srinivas for his Uh, humbleness and creativity uh so like this i have uh, people across the board who have inspired me uh on many things so it is very difficult to get inspired by just a single individual because uh different individuals bring in a lot of uh, i would say a lot of flavors and a uh, lot of uniqueness like for example i was i was always uh, been very very fascinated and inspired by uh one mr vidya sagar uh so he is actually the head of uh, of helping hand it's called udavam karangal in uh, in tamil nadu so even before many of these ngos mushroomed all over india all over the world he was doing fascinating social work uh so uh, very very uh, i would say very inspired uh, inspiring individual so when you look at people around you i think you can get inspired from everybody uh, it just doesn't have to be uh, a single individual who can give you uh all that inspiration uh, i get inspired by my my colleagues with whom i work uh whether it is a junior senior they all bring the their best their best versions to the table uh irrespective of their of their personal issues or personal challenges they all come to work mm-hmm. and put up their best uh so uh, i think uh, it's very difficult to get inspired by one single that's what i believe Okay yeah got you so there has not been a uh, one person in your life there are multiple people who have shaped up uh, this uh, Kartik Ramani who is today so yes. thank you Kartik for this insight um, now for young pharmaceutical professional who are watching us what are the three most important skill set uh, you think they should have to make them successful in their career uh, i think the first thing is passion i think without passion uh, i don't think Uh, you will be able to achieve it uh, you need that passion and and drive to uh, to say uh, i want to work in this particular chosen area of work uh definitely uh, curiosity inquisitiveness uh, is absolutely needed uh, uh, the universe is too vast there are so many unknowns so you must continue to be curious and uh, i think uh, the other important thing is uh, i would say uh, be very humble uh, i think if you are humble i think you will learn a lot uh, i think um, that is very very important and i think the life has various ways to keep you humble uh, it will keep you grounded in various ways personal or professional uh, it, it doesn't matter i think it will keep you grounded and i think in that process uh, i think a uh, lot of things come to them i think you you you're open to learning you're open to criticisms you're open to sharing you're open to receiving so yeah i think passion uh, uh, i would say then inquisitiveness or curiosity and being humble these are the three things i believe will uh, i think will help individual in any career it is not pharmaceutical scientist but uh, in any area of work yes okay so kartik's message is 
be passionate be curious and be humble and of course humbleness is something um, when we are so young we do not realize it but i think age is something also one of the factor which with age you become more and more wise person so that something also comes up with experience but still if you are young and if you would like to know um, what karthik's opinion in that so please be humble that's one of the message he would give okay so uh, karthik uh, coming back to your work style um, what comes um, you get the responsibility you get the power but it also brings a lots of pressure so it's it's a saying right power comes always with a great responsibility and pressure right uh, how do you handle such kind of pressure being at a senior leadership position uh i think there's no magic mantra here uh, <laughs> uh sometimes uh, you react to certain things as i said there are certain innate uh, qualities with which you react to a particular situation so i would say sometimes i'm impulsive uh, i'm an impulsive person Uh, definitely uh, sometimes i i act and then think uh, and i always say i should not do that uh, but in some cases it has helped me too uh, so i think uh, handling pressure is something that uh, i think you will learn to you will learn to apply uh, over a period of time uh, and i and once again i think the the way you actually manage your pressure is that uh, is that uh, uh you reach out to you reach you, you reach out to your network i think whether it is internal or external uh i think you reach out to people who might have experienced certain things and try to understand how they would have reacted to that particular situation uh i think i would always uh, i would say i i reach out to many of my peer group or my senior senior colleagues to understand uh whether they have experienced this something like like what i'm experiencing in the past and how they have managed this and certainly some of the some of those advices and some of those uh, i would say nuances and uh, helps me to kind of uh, i would say calibrate the situation and manage the manage it but it's very you can't write a, a standard operating procedure to manage pressure in some situations you do well in some situations you wish you had done better uh, and that continues even today Okay. Yeah, got you. So, uh, thank you, Karthik, for all these insights. And uh, uh, we have a fun segment round in our interview. Uh, that's called a rapid fire round. Um, you have to be really quick in your answers uh, and okay. should say whatever comes to your mind first, very first. So, no need to think and then answer. It will be very spontaneous. And this is to just know uh, how Karthik works or. what has made karthik what he is today so just those kind of questions so are you ready for the questions and excited yeah sure please go ahead <laughs> okay so um karthik what's that one purpose in your life that motivates you to get out of the bed in the morning well uh, i think what better than actually uh, being in a in a in a field where you are trying to make medicines and people will be actually taking what you will be manufacturing so i think there is nothing greater than that i think you are literally uh, at that moment you are actually playing god literally uh, what you do is going to really impact lives and uh, what better way to get up in the morning okay so the fulfillment karthik said fulfillment having a feeling of that you are saving lives so that nothing can be a bigger purpose than that okay that's a good answer another second question is what's your favorite part of your current role i think uh, solving extremely challenging scientific and business problems uh, so uh, i think that really kind of uh, keeps me motivated all the time very complicated issues uh, which involves cross functional teams coming together uh, people with different expertise coming together to solve challenging scientific issues which has uh, a big impact on the business as well as to the patient ecosystem so i think that is what keeps me going almost on a daily basis good okay so what are the three most important thing that you have learned over the past few years in your life if you have to name any three uh i think uh, give you a certain time don't rush into things that's what i is uh, giving you giving yourself time and don't rush into things uh 
i think be a good listener uh definitely and uh, i think uh, follow your heart uh i think these three things are the most important uh, giveaways uh, i will have if you ask me what i learned in the last three in the last few years okay thank you kartik um so now my next question is if you have to have a dinner party with someone who will be the three people in your dinner list <laughs> that's little funny list. but yeah okay. I, i i think i i'll uh, definitely michael jordan oh uh, wow and uh, R- ratan tata okay and the third one will be uh, i think uh, i uh, i really want to meet some of these uh, one of the top public health expert uh, in the world uh, i think i do i forgot the name of that person i think his name is uh, i think uh, he is actually the head of uh, arvind hai hospital he's part of the arvind hai hospital uh, in uh, which is based out of uh, chennai and i think uh, they have this they have this manufacturing unit auto labs which they operate out of my, of madurai actually and they provide uh, i care to uh, what do you call to a lot of poor people uh, i think his name is uh, actually uh, tulasi raj ravila of arvind i care so okay, he is considered as tulasi raj ravila i think he is considered as one of the top most uh, is is i think he is in the top 30 world public health expert uh, and of course if you look at the, the li- that list i would love to have dinner with any one of them uh, it's amazing amazing group of people who are really making an impact on in the public health space okay that's an interesting list so you want to have a dinner with michael jordan you want yeah. to have a dinner with ratan tata and then a uh, public health expert that you said tul tulsi ras so if yeah. people are not aware about him for sure we should go and google about him so yeah we now know one more person through you in this interview So thank you Karthik and uh, now my next question is are you a ambitious person or you are to go with flow kind of person I think it's a combination of both I don't think you can be either way uh, I do go with the flow but I do have my own ambition so you you need both uh you need ambition to push yourself drive yourself but at the same time I think going with the flow also helps you to kind of uh, maneuver around the reality uh, and keeps you grounded so I would say both. Okay, so the combination of both depending on the situation. Okay, and what matters uh, most to Karthik, speed or accuracy? <laughs> well, uh, probably when I started, accuracy, uh, but now I think uh, it is speed. So once again, uh, you need both if you have to succeed in this in this field. And uh, of course, you are in, at the end of the day in in a, in a, in a business setup. so definitely speed at which you do things does make an impact and uh, and of course uh, accuracy is a given now it's a question of basically how quickly can you basically act and accurately do things so yes when i so just to so i would say start uh, i probably when i entered the industry it was more about accuracy not the speed but i think with time uh, you realize that you need both Mm, but you have to pick one kartik that's a great skip from the question <laughs> <laughs> ah well uh, in my current role speed ah, okay okay see you <laughs> fine um do you get angry at work or not just a yes of course. Or? yes you do okay <laughs> fine uh, you are early a morning person or a late night person absolutely an early morning person Hmm. Okay. Most of the lead- leaders are early morning. So you are at five a.m. club. Yeah, five by five thirty to six. I'm up, okay. and okay. Uh, my mind is the is the sharpest at that time. Uh, okay. And I think by evening six p.m. or seven, uh, I think my my mind uh, really starts uh, struggling to to put together things. Okay. Fine. Uh, Kanta, are you a spiritual person or a devotional person? Um, I think I'm. I'm definitely. Uh, I'm not ritualistic, uh, uh, and uh, I am. I am spiritual, uh, and I'm certainly. I wouldn't call myself very religious or beautiful. Uh, so yeah. So of course, I'm devoted to my art, but uh, I wouldn't call myself uh, devout. Uh, I would not. I don't think I believe in a lot of rituals uh, and deity worship. But yes, spiritual. probably the best way to describe it yeah spirituality so that's something also keeps you calm composed and relaxed with your heavy work 
it keeps me i don't know about calm and composed but it helps me to <laughs> manage things <laughs> okay great uh, so the last question from uh, this fun round is uh, what uh, matters for karthik the most work or family family okay that was not without uh, even a second thought karthik tech said family <laughs> Okay yeah i think work is uh, just part of our life but family is something uh, who are always there with us in our all ups and downs so absolutely absolutely okay so with this we are now done with our rapid fire round uh, you can take a deep breath now okatik <laughs> coming to uh, your music love now i know you are a great music lover and um, you are very passionate for it and you also said you were working for dool darshan and all right so that's where you have been uh, already a part of um so what do you do in your free time uh, is that music or something else uh i used to read a lot although i don't these days much uh definitely the the work schedule is quite punishing at times uh, and it doesn't allow me to uh, engage in a lot of reading but yes i definitely wind down with a lot of music uh it definitely calms my mind a lot and uh and now with access to all these fantastic music clips uh uh with just a click in your smartphone uh it helps me to really kind of wind me down and of course i uh i, I love hitting the gym at least 3 to 4 days a week uh it helps me to kind of uh, it's a kind of a good uh, let out for me uh along with the music Okay, fine. So with this, we are now reaching towards the end of our interview. And in last, uh, I would like to ask you, what advice will you give to any budding pharma professional who wants to grow in their career like you? Be passionate. I think you have to be passionate. Uh, I think without passion, you will not get anywhere. And uh, be open to learning. Uh, I think there's a lot of opportunities there. Uh, don't try to don't constrain yourself by saying that oh i can only do this i think keep keep yourself open to learning and uh, most importantly the other one is uh, i think as i said uh, you will have to be uh, very uh, humble and accepting of things around you uh, i think that is very very important uh, you'll have to accept the fact that there are people who are smarter than you, uh, which is a fact and uh, you must uh, find ways to uh, tap into their uh, into their psychology and try to understand how they bring out their best and uh, and and involve them as uh, in your career growth uh, i think that is very important i think collaborating with them to solve difficult problems uh, which are meaningful to you uh, i think is absolutely very important so passion um uh, be accepting and and always be on the learning mode and uh, most and the, the third one is being humble and collab- collaborating with really really smart people who can help you in the journey okay for sure that's going to be a valuable advice for many including me uh, so um there is a lot to learn from your journey kartik and i wish you really a very very best uh, that you keep doing the work that you are doing the impactful work that you are doing to bring affordable medicines to market to patients who are in need um and going forward i would love to be um, part of or i would love to be witness of your this impactful work uh, once again thank you kartik for joining this call and to provide all these insights to the audience who is watching us thank you neha for having me it was wonderful talking to you and uh, i'm hoping to i watch all your videos and your uh, passion for regulatory work uh, so keep up the great work that you are doing and i also wish you the very very best thank you kartik bye 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 bye